Well, it's 11 o'clock. So let's now begin our webinar. I'd like to introduce myself. I am Alexandra Obach and I'm the executive director of the Global Intercultural Health Center at the Science and Innovation in Medicine Institution at the School of Medicine, University of Development and School of Psychology, same university. You are all welcome to this webinar cycle, climate change, migration and health in Latin America and the Caribbean. This is a webinar cycle organized by the Center of Global Intercultural Health, University of Development in Chile. Also the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education from Columbia University, the United States. Also Lancet Migration, uh, Latin American Hub, Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research the IAI and the Chilean Network of Research and Health Migration, uh, Rechisa. I would like to uh, make some announcements for this webinar. First of all, this webinar is being uh, broadcast in English and Spanish as we have simultaneous interpretation today. At the bottom of the screen, you can see a globe symbol. That, say, that reads language interpretation. When you click on that button, you can choose the language uh, you want to hear today. The languages available are English and Spanish. Also, you can also uh, greet us and tell us your affiliation and your country in the chat. And this helps our networking. And it also helps us create this community um, around the topics we have in common. Also, um, please, as panelists and, and uh, speakers, try to speak at a normal space, a normal pace, because we have simultaneous interpretation and we need to help the interpreters. So if you have any questions or comments, you're welcome. Uh, to ask your questions in the Q&A uh, section. And please remember that I will be checking the Q&A so that we can consider some of these uh, questions during the session as they will be addressed by our panelists. If we don't have time to address all the questions, we will be uh, answering them in the following, uh, in the upcoming seminars. Let us now begin by making a general description of this webinar cycle for the new participants. This series of webinar series aim to address the complex dynamic and multi-level relationship within climate change, international migration, and the health of population, the population in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, this is based on as a strong link between these institutions. So this webinar series aims to lead knowledge uh, on the topic based on the experiences and real life uh, activities of heterogeneous communities in the subcontinent of uh, Central and South America. Today, we have the, the third webinar on uh, drought, heat, and extreme weather, climate forces on food and security in Latin America and the Caribbean. This session includes uh, two speakers, their presentations, uh, um, are made today by two remarkable academicians. So let us now begin today's session by welcoming Professor Alejandra Diaz de Leon. Alejandra, please turn on your camera. Hi, 
Welcome, Alejandra. Alejandra is a research professor at the Sociology and Criminology uh, Department at the University of Essex. She focuses on migration through Mexico. She has been working with migrants for over 10 years, and she has also worked with shelters for migrants. Welcome, Alejandra, and you have the floor. Hello, thank you so much for this invitation. I am very excited to see you all here. It's great to have so many participants today and I'll try to speak slowly. Uh, this uh, presents my many years of research, research with John Doran White, who is also available here today and he can answer questions as well. We have studied this since 2020. We have just conducted some uh, field work in Mexico and we still have funds to continue studying shelters and migrants. So this is what we're doing now. This is a shelter where we do our field work. Now I would like to talk about our 2020-2021 field work. This shelter is located in the center of Mexico City sorry, in the center of Mexico. It's um, precarious next to the railways. It's a transit shelter. Almost all migrants that go through Central America and go through this place because they uh, travel on their own or through uh, a cheap means. So they stay here for two or three days as they go towards Mexico or the United States. We work as volunteers and conduct interviews, and we have information about two summers, 2021, 2022. During that time, we interviewed 40 migrants on their lives in Central America, their migration experiences, and how their climate change affects their international migration decision making. It was difficult to start talking to them about uh, climate change because we had to ask them about things like water, rain, droughts, and floods. But gradually, we were able to uh, make a connection. Most of the people interviewed were from Honduras, Guatemala, and Nicaragua. Almost all of them men because of the type of migration route, but there are also uh, migrating uh, families. Um, most were young and middle-aged. Almost everyone worked in the field of agriculture. Central America. Central America is where, uh, where the interviewees came from. This is one of the center of the areas that is most affected by climate change in the Western Hemisphere. We can already see the effects of uh, climate extremes in Central America and, and things will get even worse. The most frequent climate events in Central America and that we have seen in our interviews are hurricanes, inconsistent rainfall. Uh, so basically it's a lot of water when we shouldn't have so much water and the other way around. Um, extreme temperatures, especially uh, a lot of heat and the rocha, which is a coffee pest. Uh, there are many mitigation strategies to address these climate events, and many interviewees have uh, tried to implement these strategies, but um, their main strategy was international migration and they had to leave their families behind. I would like to tell you about the three ways in which climate crisis is affecting life, health, and livelihood of people in Central America. First of all, food insecurity. Extreme climate events such as droughts and floods, including the effects of hurricanes, increase food insecurity for people, in particular for peasants in Central America. Although some city dwellers told us that uh, food prices are higher now. If there's a lot of water, there is a problem with crops. So many people, after the Gallota, um um hurricanes said that their crops had rotten and that the food provided by the government was not edible because at the very beginning they weren't even able to fish also because of the contamination and the fish didn't seem uh, safe enough to eat. 
so they went hungry. Also, some crops would rot because they would get too much rainfall. Someone said, for instance, that in Honduras, they have a, in the a town a pond that it's, it gets dry every year, but once it flooded and they lost their full uh, watermelon crops. And sometimes the opposite because of droughts. Sorry, Alexand Alexander, that I'm interrupting you. Can you speak a bit more slowly so that the interpreters can, interpreters can keep up? Thank you. Sorry for interrupting you. Thank you. Thank you. Sometimes water is not enough and agriculture depends on, on rainfall in Central America and rainfall hasn't been uh, consistent in the last few years in Central America. So peasants expect uh, wait for rainfall in the winter, but there are not enough crops or crops are insufficient during the season because there is not enough water. And if it doesn't rain, we have less maize, beans, etc., which are the, the staples in Central America. The results, are the, the consequences are very clear, but people have not enough money to eat. So peasants eat less food than they would if there were enough food. Uh, and this is the case during three months every year, uh, according to a study conducted. In our interviews, we saw that migrants say that they didn't have enough food for long periods uh, throughout the year. And peasants need to take loans to buy more resistant uh, uh, grains are also some uh, chemical products and their livelihoods become uh, unsustainable because they need to spend more money. Uh, Romulo from Guatemala said winter is no longer consistent. We can't predict uh, it. Crops don't stick in summer. Nothing grows. That's why we started to leave our country to find a better future. Number two, lack of access to water. Uh, forests have been eliminated in Central America in order to grow cattle, for instance, and this has affected water, uh, underground water. This uh, cutting down of trees might have to do with organized crime as well, according to our interviewees. And this uh, cutting, this forest cutting down of forests is not regulated. At the beginning, people were not happy with this activity, but with the progress of the work done, because this creates uh, jobs uh, uh, for people. But then at some point they see that uh, this affects them because it, it, the weather gets hotter, it rains more, and many times they are fired from their jobs, so they don't even get to keep the the job they got. Rivers have no, uh, and wells have no more clean water, for instance. Also, uh, there are some intensive industries such as rice crops or fisheries that have contaminated water even more. So at some at the beginning they were happy to have a job, but, but then they noticed that uh, uh, the river is contaminated because of the fisheries, and they had no more access to drinking water. So many of our interviewees have no access to clean water, and that of course affects their health, brings about diseases, diarrhea, dehydration, and stomach issues. Hector says. Um, the climate change that is affecting us the most is that there is no water. Where we're from, there is no more water as we had many years. There are no more freshwater wells. Number three, heat. Heat is uh, more and more intense. In Central America, storms are more intense because of heat. There, there are higher deforestation rates and droughts. And this affects food security and the health of people, of the people we interviewed. Um, our interviewees worked uh, in agriculture. There were, there were outdoor workers and many of them planted crops or worked uh, in someone else's establishment. Some of them were uh, construction workers. And they told us that well, when they were younger, they would go out in the field and work for longer 
because they would go out and work with their grandparents or fathers and that was fine but after 15 or 20 years working outdoors all day long is much harder in particular for older people um even if that if they have access to water so they tell us that they get a uh, heat stroke they sweat a lot they cannot think clearly when they're working outside uh, outdoors they say that heat affects you because at the end of the day you get home after eight hours of work and you have a headache and you just can't cool down you feel there's something wrong with your body your bones hurt and your head hurts too from the heat so we can see that the, this really affects people's body and their capacity to work to be outdoors and to enjoy life also, most of the food, as we have said, that these uh, migrants uh, eat, they come from a from a rainfall agri uh, based agriculture, so they don't have enough food to eat. Well, conclusions. As Baltica said in her introduction, our studies show that the effects of the climate crisis are have several causes and are interrelated. There is a lack of rainfall, heat, food insecurity. These are all interrelated factors. And some people talk about heat in their interviews. Others talk about the lack of water. Others talk about uh, other problems. But everything is interrelated. Extreme weather events such as hurricanes, droughts, pests, or intense heat, for instance, make already precarious situations even worse. These people were already poor and living in, uh, in terrible conditions. And this, all of this makes things worse. And this affects um, uh, agricultural workers or coastal dwellers. We didn't talk to many city dwellers, but mainly they said they had limited access to clean water. And also they said that food products were more expensive. These people uh, uh, also mentioned th that the government was not present when it came to decision making. And also, uh, the government didn't provide support during and after the crisis. When I talked, when we talked about the government, they said that the government didn't help. Also, there was no access to medications or uh, clinics where they lived. So cl the climate crisis affected them in ways that couldn't be solved. In many of our interviews, they said that they were migrating in order to improve their, their, theirs and their family's health. Uh, they also talk about how the climate crisis affects uh, international migrants. But of course, uh, there are many other weather events that include other types of mobility and migration that we couldn't assess because these are the people that stayed in Central America. So they were not included in this research. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry I was speaking so fast. Uh, I thought I was speaking slowly. Thank you. Thank you so much. Alejandra, for your participation. And thank you for your uh, very interesting presentation that talks about what is happening in Mexico regarding climate change and its consequences in a specific social and political context as is the Mexican reality and the Central American reality in general. Let us now give the floor to Professor Jean Ometo. Jean, please turn on your camera. Hi, Jean, welcome. Thank you so much, Alexandra. Thank you. I'll introduce Jan in English, please uh, interpret into Spanish, and you can listen to this on Zoom. The senior research at the Brazilian Institute of Space Research and head of the Strategic Projector Division. His recent academic and research activities are centered on the impacts of 
anthropogenic and climate changes drivers in natural and modified landscapes, including mitigation and adaptation actions by the use of sustainability indicators. On the science policy dialogue, his activities include contributions to the Brazilian National Plan for Adaptation on Mapping, Vulnerability and Exposure of Socio-Ecological Systems and to the Brazilian National Communication to the UNFCCC. So, very welcome, Jen. Muy bienvenido, Jen. Uh, muchas y, gracias, <laughs> Alessandra. Thank you so much, Alessandra. Okay, okay. I will so give thank you the floor you, for your presentation. Thank you very much for the invitation. Apologies for speaking in English, um, but my Portuñol is just awful. <laughs> so um, I would like to thank um, uh, uh, Baltica and Haile for the invitation, and um, it's very nice to be here. So, um, and uh, it, I'm really glad that I'm going to talk after Alejandra uh, because it's a, it's a different perspective in terms of um, how we 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 look to this this question of food insecurity in our region and how that dialogue with the multiple factors in terms of pressures and um, and which with climate change is being worsening so um so i'm it's pretty much what i'm going to talk a little bit about is uh the state of the climate uh, as we are um we just saw very nicely how at very local level how different climate um forcing are driving people to move from their uh, place for their location and migrate and also affecting the, their health and everything. So um, so the problem that is facing us is that uh, it's, it's a deep change in climate and uh, which is being exponential um, uh, in the past, uh, well, we know in the past 100 years, but in the past 50 years, this has been increasing uh, in, a, in a rate uh, not ever seen before. So not only the fact that the temperatures are high, but they are changing in a rate that is very fast for the ecosystems, for the production systems to adapt to this change in climate. So it's it's a, a big issue facing us. And um, so that's been calling climate emergency. And uh, one aspect that is crucial for any sort of decision is to incorporate the urgency of the action into the production system, into the society, so into the social perspective of the day-to-day -day living. So, um, uh, so we, we cannot undermine the aspect that we're facing a big change in climate in the globe. There's another important aspect on this, which dialogues a lot with social movements and also with um, uh, with the inequality, with different aspects of social behavior in the globe, which is the climate agenda. It's a sustainability agenda. So those two thinking dialogues in a common uh, in a common way, it should at least. So if we're looking to the climate, we're looking to sustainability and vice versa. So it's it's a, it's a matter of having this incorporated in our actions day to day. Um, uh, another important aspect of this is, are the dimensions of the consequence. So um, we need a clear and objective mapping. So I think what has been shown so far and is that the, the global inequality has been is being expressed more, um, more, more clearly at the surface, also uh, in relation to climate events, so climate extreme events. Uh, and there's a, and it, we need to go a balance. So we need to mitigate not only the the effects of what is going on right now, but also mitigate the future uh, um, uh, increase of climate uh, problems of climate hazards. And uh, but also we need to adapt, 
and the adaptation dialogues very, very strongly with, with food production, with food security, with quality of food, and uh, with access of food. So this all goes to the adaptation uh, aspect of this that goes that, sh that has to go along with mitigation in terms of several aspects, of, as I just mentioned. And just to give a, 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 a broad view here, sorry about Brazil, uh, to the to the right <laughs> or to the left side of the the, the screen here, but um, we we are facing a drier and hotter continent. So Latin America in general, we're just seeing South American here and Brazil. Sorry, apology for that. The Latin America in general is facing a hotter and drier continent, and we are basically uh, a a we we. A lot of our economies are based on agriculture, and agriculture is a, it's a major issue in our countries, um, not only in the tropical belt of all the countries, but all the regions as well. So, But we're facing that. If we see temperature, we see how temperature affects people. And, uh, um, and uh, by the way, the uh, heat waves kill much more. Well, the, the, the casualties of heat waves are much higher than casualties of uh, of um, a, a disaster, for instance. So heat waves are a big issue, affects not only people, but production as well. The changes in, pre in precipitation, that's another uh, 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 um, central problem on this perspective of food production. Because most of agriculture in our region, I would say that maybe six, five to six percent of agriculture in the whole Latin America is, is irrigated. Most are rain fed. So the fluctuation, not only extreme events in precipitation, but the fluctuation of the precipitation, the anomalies that we, we face, these affect direct production. And not only the amount of food that is produced, but also the quality of food that is produced. So so those are problems that were they're, they're facing us, and we need to have solutions for them. So uh, just coming to some IPCC, so I had the opportunity to, to work. Several colleagues on the region has the opportunity to work on IPCC as well. So um, so the, the climate change is stressing agriculture, um, uh, not only agriculture, but fisheries as well, aquaculture, and the, the production of food um, uh, in, in, a, in, in a broader perspective in the globe. So this literature, the scientific literature is, is, you know, has high evidence on this for the whole globe. So we are really face a, 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 an issue uh, related to climate change impacts and production of food. Um, the 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 you know the the heat uh, the warming of the country is um, it has been altering also the distribution of where we can produce food. Or we can have agriculture, or in and it has a strong impact on the small agriculture, but also it's changing not only the area that is suitable for uh, for production, but also the the how plants are functioning under a different climate, how insects or diff other uh, uh, other sort of a. Uh, 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 issues on agricultural productions are emerging. And uh, so this is affecting quality and the harvest stability of, uh, of agriculture. So not only the production, not only the quality, but the stability of that production as well. Um, so, and climate change affects everyone, but the vulnerable groups, such as uh, women in general, children, low-income households, indigenous and other minority groups and the small scale producers are family producers are often in high risk not only of access to food but malnutrition livelihood loss rising costs so all this perspective that dialogues a lot with the need of move from the region they are so these also feed the the need to migrate feed the 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 aspect of uh, losing health and good and and or good and well being, so those are our statements that came out not from me from my PCC from the chap uh, chapter five which deal with foods uh, with food and other. Um, uh, 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 food and other products. I forgot, I forgot the, the title of the chapter. Apologies for this, but this is on this latest IPCC report. And uh, oh, this should go on. I don't know what happened here. 
Oh, there we go. So, and then we, if we, we if you come, so that's a chapter that we worked on. If if we do a zoom in our region, if we got only the food, uh, the uh, the food systems here, which has been, uh, I'll I'll do a laser point here, which has been highlighted here, uh, we see that there is a high confidence of the vulnerability of those systems in Central America. In part of, Latin, of of South America as well, but it's still from high to very high vulnerability level. This is distributed throughout the whole our our whole region here, with some part of that in a higher uh, level of uh, confidence, uh, but a very high vulnerability. So that's really clear in Central America, and I think that the example that Alejandro just showed us state clearly that this is a fact that is going on. So uh, this is, uh, was an analysis from uh, also the, this IPCC report as well on chapter 12. So this is include all the scientific literature. And part of this literature that we are uh, working on, on on those assessments, that those include, oh, I have, I'm on 10 minutes already, so I'm, I'm going to finish quite soon. So um, includes uh, the, not only literature, uh, scientific literature, but we're trying to bring also local knowledge and uh, indigenous knowledge to mostly to broadly understand uh, the level of impact and the opportunities to, uh, uh, to in a way, uh, uh, solve the problem. So this is another, also another, uh, how the synthesis is looking to different regions in South America. So this is a little bit just looking a little bit down on those uh, specific aspects. So the F, the scientific evidence are there and uh, are brought throughout the whole the whole region. And uh, so and one important aspect. So we've been talking about production so far now a little bit also on how that impact the nutrition, how that impact access and everything. So. Um, in our region, so there is about 6.5% of the population looking to this recent um, UN report that are under uh, suffer from hunger. And about two point, uh, which is uh, almost half of our, uh, a third of our region population experience moderate or, 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 uh, or severe food insecurity. And uh, just to give an example, if we look to Brazil for, in 1940, the areas where food security was most, uh, 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 was high are the areas that today also face the same problem. So inequality has grown, but inequality has also, uh, has it has a geographic distribution in the region that we need to look at. So, and the dimension of food security, as we know, is not only the availability, the production of food, but how it's available, how people can access, what is the stability of access, and how adequate is the food uh, use and the food quality. So I'm not going through this because I, I went over my, my time already, but this is another uh, 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 chart that, brings all the different factors of the vulnerabilities of uh, the the which affect health directly from environmental uh, factors to socioeconomic factors to the uh, susceptibility of uh, of uh, of uh, impact in that the, the, not only the social infrastructure political commitment and uh, how the Status of uh, population health, how vectors are associated to environment and to socioeconomic factor. So how these all get together, but also some sort of a solutions. Where are so that's where we look, need to look at under the uh, question that are uh, are facing us. How are the solutions? Where we need to look? How we need to work at country level, at municipality level, at community levels. Uh, just to uh, 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 also an interesting aspect that Lina Salazar brought on that this IDB report is that how our region move away from a, a sort of a better condition in in, in early uh, 90s and 2000s to a worse condition now. So that was exacerbated by COVID, but the, uh, so the deterioration of the security in the region, it's clear throughout time. So, uh, so climate change is part of this aspect, but we know that there's another, uh, other issues uh, associated to this as well. So very quickly, so uh, we need to map risk so what is the risk for food production and for food insecurity? So uh, what we do uh, in, as an uh, 
example for our uh, region here, we do what's called uh, risk flower, uh, which will look to vulnerability, exposure, and the climate hazard in a specific uh, re uh, region of the country. So uh, this is a, is a very local example. Apologies for this, but we do we try to do in a very high spatial resolution to identify what is the, for instance, in this context here, uh, the drought, the impact risks for food security, but in, in, in the production, but not only in production, it, which include the access, include uh, the quality of food. So the drought risk for food security in a way. So we can do that. We can have this as an example for decision makers to look at and uh, to provide or to proposed solution for the regions. So um, climate change we will increase inequality, we know that. And if we do not ensure just transition, so that's what we need to do. We need to do a just transition to a more sustainable world and a more sustainable uh, relation of people to nature and to uh, and to resource. Um, uh, we the impact our most vulnerable uh, on the most environment communities are uh, are clear, so that's an issue that need to be uh, uh, need to be uh, worked out. Uh, social organizations from the how the, the participation of society on the governance of a session for building climate resilience. So this is basic how we do work to have a, a, a production system, a society re resilience to climate. The governance uh, has to be reconfigured. So we need to have a broader dialogue among different sectors and actors of society to have this trade-off in terms of dynamic and adaptation options. Uh, so that goes along with you know multi-sector policies. Now, uh, the judicialization of climate damage is something that comes together with this context and can really act in terms of changing behavior, of transforming a uh, production system and, uh, and transforming society in general. Uh, so adaptation policy is something that we need definitely to work with and uh, actions at multiple scales as well. So uh, I'm really apologized that I, I, I went over my time, but thank you very much. Obrigado, gracias, and I, yeah, I'm open for questions. Thank you so much, Jan, for your wonderful presentation. You were well within time, just a few minutes uh, over time. Um, thank you, Jan, so much for this overview of what is happening in the region uh, around uh, heat and temperature, temperatures rising in the agriculture sector, in food production, and how that in fact, it's affecting the entire population, but especially vulnerable communities and how this brings different risks and we need that we need to address. And as you very well said, we have high level solutions and other uh, at the local level. Welcome to everyone who has joined us, who has introduced themselves in the chat. Thank you so much. This helps us build this network, which is one of the goals of this series of webinars. Now we would like to welcome our panelist who is going to comment on both uh, Alejandra's and Jan's presentations. We have Alice Blukach here. Today, could you turn on the, your camera? Thank you so much. It's great to have you. Uh, hello, Alexandra. Thank you for having me. Okay, so Alice is a political scientist from the Manchester University with a master's in international immigration and public policies from the London School of Economics. She researches, her research is based on migration and health, health systems, interculturality, and she is currently re a researcher at the Global Center on Interculturality at the Development Center in Chile. In Chile. Welcome, Alice. Uh, thank you, Alexandra. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm so happy. Thank you, Baltica, for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here, to be able to comment 
on this topic after Alexandra, Alexandra's and John's presentations that brought um, many uh, great topics. Before you begin, Thank you. Please remember to speak slowly so that our wonderful interpreters can understand you. Thank you so much. And now, of course, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll try to speak slowly. So, first of all, I would like to thank you for your presentations. Thank you, Alejandra and Jeanne who have provided some very interesting elements. Alejandra has shared with us the testimony of communities that are now facing food insecurity and climate change mobility. And Jeanne has told us about the changes brought about climate change in the production of, uh, in food production regionally. As we have seen, food insecurity is a, a uh, varied uh, phenomenon that can be measured at different scales. Um, there are many studies in this regard, especially uh, even including migrant uh, population. There's a very specific con uh, element that has to do with what both speakers has, have said. And this is culture when it comes to climate change, migration and health. First of all, as Jeanne has uh, correctly said, food insecurity uh, uh, takes place or can take place because of a lack of uh, supply and food availability. There might also be an access barrier that can be geographic, financial, etc. And this is a barrier that people or communities need to face. Also, these uh, events can happen uh, sometimes or they can be chronic. Regarding health, the current literature states that food insecurity affects uh, both mental and physical health. Regarding physical health, the uh, consequences are quite clear. Uh, because food insecurity uh, prevents people from getting their nutritional physiological needs met. Regarding mental health, food insecurity can have a negative impact uh, on mental health because it increases the risk of suffering uh, common uh, mental disorders such as stress, anxiety, depression, sleep disorders. I can also uh, exacerbate uh, already existing disorders. Some specific risk factors entailed by food insecurity that affect mental health. Uh, they can also, they affect the regular population and also migrants and internally displaced people. These factors include <clears throat> discrimination, unemployment, informal employment, that might uh, take place among uh, migrant populations or people that have an irregular temporary employment status. Also the lack of nutrient rich foods such as fruits and vegetables during the migration process. So in this whole transit process, uh, intermediate countries and um, as people uh, settle down in the host country as well. There might also be relative food insecurity when compared to the local population or the population of the country of origin. Also, these people might have limited social networks that might not, so they might not be getting the help they need when it comes to mental health caused by food insecurity. Gender is also relevant because migration flows are include now more women than ever. And food insecurity, especially related to poor mental health or negative mental health impacts on women, in particular, um, women that lead their households. 
Of course, these aspects are more urgent and catastrophic regarding food insecurity and its impact on mental and physical health. But also there's the cultural aspect, especially regarding people uh, in, mo in mobility in Latin America and the Caribbean. We know and we can all agree that food is a central element in our daily life as marked by our culture. Food is also a way of expressing ourselves or a way to um, consolidate our beliefs and our culture. And also food uh, brings us memories of happier times from the past, especially when it comes to uh, people that are going through a migration process that can be really challenging. So if they're migrating and they cannot find or afford culturally relevant foods, um, even beyond food insecurity situations, if they are not able to find this food they are used to that are culturally relevant or food in general, uh, they cannot get this food in a social, socially acceptable way. So these are all risk factors that might affect mental health. This means that we need to consider the cultural aspects of food insecurity in a human mobility context. And also when it comes to climate change, and in particular when we bring these two together, climate change endangers uh, short and long term uh, food uh, production, especially food that has uh, that is culturally relevant um, for local populations, for instance, maize or beans in Central America or rice, quinoa and potato in Andean countries. These are just some regional examples. Additionally, climate change can cause uh, the displacement of populations indirectly or indirectly, internally, domestically, within a country, or internationally. These are people that cannot afford culturally relevant foods. Um, so they need to migrate, and this might also affect their mental health during the migration process. So, this has been seen in the migration from rural to urban areas, even within a country or to other countries. In the case of migration to other countries that eat foods that are drastically different. Um, therefore, um, there might be some countries that undergo food insecurity can find solutions, uh, especially when it comes to climate change and to prevent forced displa displacement situations. For instance, they can promote the knowledge of indigenous uh, and local people, as Jeanne has said. There are other potential solutions uh, that can be uh, adopted by host countries uh, in order to help uh, migrants that are already uh, there in their countries. And this might benefit the health of these people in a mobility situation. The idea is to promote food sovereignty and also to allow these people to access culturally relevant food and ingredients first of all, but also uh, they should help them to participate in food production. So this can also reduce the environmental impact of importing these foods. These initiatives have to do with promoting uh, urban farms, for instance. Um, and the idea is to wor work with displaced people, international migrants. There are examples of this in Latin America and the Caribbean. In particular, the urban agriculture program in Cuenca at the end of the 90s in Ecuador. 
uh, with new practices within the rural urban migrations in the 50s. This is an initiative that is also possible and we can improve on it as well through an environmental resilience and also from a traditional and culturally relevant perspective. So this is one of the many initiatives that can be promoted when it comes to uh, the challenge of climate change and urban mobility and the mental and uh, physical health. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alice, for your comments and for introducing these dimensions that hadn't been addressed yet and that have to do with cultural mental health aspects. Thank you so much. Great. So this is the end of the amazing presentations by our panelists and commentator. So now let us address some of the questions asked in the Q&A uh, section. And also we can address other questions. So please, dear panelists and commentator, can you please turn on your cameras? Uh, Alejandra, yes, there you are. And let's welcome John Doreen White as well to this session, who will be helping uh, Professor Alejandra Diaz de Leon in the Q&A session. Jean Ameto, please turn on your camera and Alice as well. Thank you so much. Welcome, John, to this session. First of all, we'd like to thank you all for your amazing presentations and comments that provide us with so much input on this essential topic and uh, we still lack the, um, the necessary body of evidence, so all of your input is very valuable. We have received many questions and comments from our participants. I must say that we have participants from all over the world. We have many people from Latin America and the Caribbean, but also people from Asia, Europe, North America. Welcome everyone. So. Let's address a few questions, Alejandra and John, and then Jan, and then both of you, and then questions addressed to everyone, including our commentator, Alice Lukacs. So first of all, Alejandra and John. So someone's asking us, how do you consider that each, what do you consider each government should do in the countries, and particularly in Mexico, in order to mitigate all this? The person is saying, because it's very comfortable not to do anything and to just let other countries do something about migration. Uh, because on the borders, we have so many people from Colombia, for instance, and illegal traffic as well. And there is destruction of biodiversity in forests, especially we have a lot of migration towards the United States. So I would like to give you the floor to address this topic. That is very much uh, the case in Mexico, in the United States, in their border, but also includes other countries in the region. Thank you. Would you like to start, John, as I have made this presentation? Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much for the question. Uh, I'm not sure if I have an exact question regarding what uh, different governments can do. Uh, climate change in this context um, is connected to many or connects many different governments uh, as the person is asking uh, what um, the government does in Guatemala, Honduras, uh, El Salvador, Nicaragua uh, has an impact on other transit countries or host countries as well. Regarding policy migration, a migration policy, I think climate change 
uh, can affect our conversation because this affects people in the destination country. So I think that sometimes uh, in the United States, they talk about people uh, who get there and how other countries should stop migration. And I think that, unfortunately, climate change um, might make us more empathetic regarding the people in the destination country. Of course, I'm talking about what governments should do, but at the same time, we should remember that Ale and I are working on this project that focuses on the actions of several non-governmental organizations, um, also migrant shelters and other organizations that support uh, people uh, in a mobility situation, because the idea is to create legal paths for migrants and for people fleeing the effects of climate change, as they should be recognized as refugees in different destination countries. We're now beginning this project in Mexico. We are working with several organizations. So we need, of course, we need to remember what governments should do but we need to understand how different civil society organizations are dealing with all this. So we're working on it. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Alejandra, I agree with John and I would like to address the last part of the question. We do have an interpretation. Yes. Okay. So I'm not saying that the people asking the question um, has this in mind, but I think that we need to address this excuse used by the governments of Panama and the United States, for instance. They say that they need to protect biodiversity and all that, and ecologists, so they need to control the movement of migrants. And for several years, some ultra-right movements and other movements in the United States have blamed migrants uh, going through the desert, they say that they're leaving uh, rubbish behind. And as people who study climate, uh, the climate crisis and migration, we shouldn't support these arguments that make migrants more vulnerable because they blame them for affecting the, the landscape. We need to come up with solutions in order to uh, facilitate migration to prevent violence against these populations and also to uh, look after the environment. But these are excuses used uh, uh, post by these right uh, government in order to implement uh, strict uh, migration policies. I think we need to criticize these policies. So there's this human uh, dimension and this, uh, uh, yes, environment dimension uh, in the Sonora Desert. Some people are trying to cross this border. It's just a comment. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Alejandra. Here there is a comment in the Q&A section that has to do with what Alejandra and John are saying. So I'll share this with you now. Alicia is saying that she lives in Colima, Mexico. And in the city, we have Caña areas that get migration, internal migration from Oaxaca, etc. And in the last few years, some migrants, in particular women, say that migration transit from the place of origin to Colima is now a bridge to migrate to the United States. I've been working in the shelters for a short time, but, but I have detected many problems, discrimination, unemployment, informal uh, employment, limited network, etc. So we have that as well. Um, this has to do with what Alejandra and John were saying regarding their specific work in the area regarding climate change and the different factors and variables included in the vulneration of specific populations that 
work in different contexts that are problematic for these people. John, sorry, Jan, let's um, share some questions with you. So they ask me, someone says something, they want to know about sources or studies with specific data that, uh, besides the ID and C regarding the mobility, international mobility as caused by slow onset events such as drought, as Jan is saying. Data about countries or specific areas in countries or regions, for instance, the, the dry Central American corridor, including uh, the impact on health and including mental health. So a question addressed to Jan in case you have some data on this. And I want so to I would read like to another share another comment, comment with you uh, before Jan. I give you the floor, Jan. That scientists estimate that in about three decades it will be impossible to live due to in some areas because of the crowding in some islands and they uh, have made the decision to move to the continental land but the entire archipelago faces the same issues there are some other examples in the americas so how do you and another comment how do you see the issue of refugees who are in context of uh, climate calamities, such as the one that was experienced in the south of Brazil a short while ago? Well, thank you so much for your questions. I'm going to go back to English. A lot of data and a lot of information. The the. One aspect that I would say is that how this information is incorporated in the decision uh, and how it, it's not, I don't think it's, it's a matter of a dialogue. I think it's a matter of action and it's a matter, matter, matter of a changing behavior within the government's universe, which is involves government, involves the civil society, involves the private sector. So I think what the, the the experience has shown them, if we if if this dialogue is able to happen in certain aspect, and what what happened in situations as with sea level rise or uh, drought corridors or what happened with extreme events, so we have different different uh, if um, climatological hazards. So one is an extreme event as happened in the southern part of Brazil. Uh, and the other ones are kind of a, a long term uh, change in, 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 the, in, the, in the environmental, like sea level rise or even drought that become more long and more uh, strong. So um, those informations from uh, so those informations are becoming more and more precise, more and more uh, we, we can trust more and more in this information. The big issue is that it has, as I mentioned in the beginning, it has to be incorporated in the planning of the, of, you know, the community in the planning of the, so if we think in the future, so like we're talking about agriculture production, normally what we think about is on the next year production, next year, uh, uh, you know, agriculture phase. We need to start all the evolution of agricultural production in our region, in the globe in general, it was under a different climate. So we need that need to be incorporated. And part of that, uh, it's, it, it relies on local solutions. So uh, if the sea level rise, we need to have a better planning for uh, uh, communities that live close to the ocean. And this is not a planning for 100 years from now. It's a planning for 10, 12, uh, 10, 20, 20 years from now. So um, so what, what, what I, we, we try to argue is that how the scientific information, how this under, undermined uh, denier of those 
problems have to be uh, uh, looked at in, in a different perspective in a planning uh, in a planning way so the 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 multi sectoral uh, approach it's very important the transdisciplinary approach so we're looking to a specific um, uh, problem so how we incorporate different understanding different uh, knowledge uh, uh, to that specific problem to come with a solution. So we need to work in the solution space. Uh, so what happened is uh, just the last point I'll make here. Sorry, there's some regions that I, I don't particularly know uh, that were mentioned, but it, it, like in the Southern part of Brazil, the deniers are saying, so the, the, this has happened in 1940. So there's two problems of that. First problem is that in 1940, we did plan. So we are stupid. So if that happened in the past and we didn't do anything to change the, 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 the impact in the future, you know, we didn't think about. It. The second problem is that these events are becoming more frequent. So we need to learn with the, the lessons that are happening and to plan the, 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 the near future. So those events, uh, they need to be thought over very strongly. And uh, there are uh, information and that there are, uh, uh, let's say, um, solutions for that that can be given, not given, but that can be provided at local level for people to change the way, for governments to change the way and to plan for the future. So, uh, sorry, I kind of gave a big, uh, a big vision here, not going directly to specific points, but that's uh, coming to specific points. The solutions are very local. So we have a global problem with a very local solutions. Thank you so much, Jan. I am capturing the questions and comments for each of you. So I was taking a second and hopefully in the next few minutes, we will be able to answer as many questions as possible. For Alice, we have a comment that says, if you could please share uh, references on studies on the impact of climate change in connection with social cultural aspects and mental health. And if you could please share your email in the chat or the Q&A or somewhere. And uh, in the meantime, questions for both Alejandra and Jan and John. And first we have many comments um, congratulating you all for your research, your presentations and your contributions to the field. And one question that perhaps we could uh, have both Alejandra and Jan answer, if you could think, if you think that the concept of strengthening resilience is useful to improve the adaptation of the, this migrant population to climate change in the Americas. I think he's frozen. Um. You, sorry. Yeah. So. Yeah. So yeah. I. Yeah. I think. Yeah. I. I, I think we do. Uh, I. I think strength resilience is part of this. Uh, 
the, the whole complex adaptation strategy. Uh, to me also, um, a mapping of vulnerability is critical. So what makes a specific uh, society or a specific community or a specific sector vulnerable to climate change? So there's multiple aspects. The aspect that comes from finance, from economic, from uh, weak uh, juridical uh, configuration. It comes from in infrastructure. It comes from natural uh, uh, um uh, uh, na na natural, uh, uh, let's say, <laughs> uh, 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 resource. So I, I think that the mapping of, so to be able to understand what resilience means, we need to understand what vulnerability means. And we need to understand what that system is vulnerable to. So what are the elements? So I think there were beautiful uh, examples from Alejandra and from Alice and uh, certainly from John as well on their work that actually map how what are the elements that are critical for that specific part of society to be vulnerable. And that can be applied for several things from, you know, where the infrastructure are. So we cannot have a hospital where the flood is going to come, for instance. So I, I think all those mapping of vulnerability are critical to define resilience and to define the, the adaptation solutions. So what are the solutions? Solutions on adaptation, they're not cheap. They're not easy and they're not straightforward and they're very local. Uh, oh, they're, they're, you know, they're broad perspective, but they're, the local action is very important. So I think that's a little bit of my view on these perspectives abroad. So that's why most of this, most, um, um, this multidisciplinary or transdisciplinary approach, multi sector approach are very critical for defined vulnerability and consequently the resilience. And now we give the floor to Alejandra and John. Uh, well, to complement what John was saying, I agree, of course. And something John and I and other collaborators have been discussing is that it needs to be a fair, just transition. So we need to prioritize the well-being of the communities that are the most affected the most. And that doesn't always happen. If we need to build a dam or have a um, carbon capturing forest and here and then people are displaced. So listening to people, using local knowledge, hearing about their needs, thinking of what uh, being well is, what is well-being for those people because coming from the global north, from other countries or from places with other climate emergencies, we cannot apply one global solution. We need to uh, listen to the local communities. This happens uh, sometimes that this, this is missed with international organizations. Uh, there are people who are afraid, for example, of having or, or their land being taken away for ecological solutions. And so finding a balance and for this, making sure that these transitions are fair is so important. Thank you. And John, you have the floor now. Uh, it seems like we missed the connection again. It froze, but we have that uh, responsibility uh, concept. Oh, you're back. Yeah, I don't want. 
I so I'll try one more time, and then I might just yeah. need to to, <laughs> to to be a, a part of the audience. Um, the I think that one concern I have with the concept of resiliency in general is the 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 resp the the tendency to place responsibility on people who are least responsible in some ways for the, the source of climate change, um, and yet um, are 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 being put in a position through sometimes certain framings of resiliency to say ah it's up to you to fix this problem or to 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 absorb this issue with your resilience. Um, so this is not to say that resilience is not important and that resi resilience is a is some kind of negative idea, right? Um, but I do think we need to be cautious about how resilience is framed um, in ways that that value, as as Jean mentions, right, local solutions. Um, but we also need to recognize that people have been adapting, have been resilient for a long time, and oftentimes. Um, displacement is, comes after, right? The decision to leave a country comes after years and years of resiliency, right? Um, I think we the, the risk with certain framings of resiliency is that we say, ah, people have not been resilient up until now, um, and we can instill some form of resiliency. No, people have been very resilient, um, are adapting how resilience operates in the context of climate change. Uh, just a couple things um, to continue with what John was saying. And a, a resilience a strategy for these people is uh, international migration. So when we say resilience, it's not just stay in your country. There are some uh, circular mobility strategies that are in the toolkit of resilience strategy at the personal and family level, international migration has always existed and it's going to continue to be one option. Uh, I don't think it, it shows uh, an international migration doesn't show that you're not resilient. Exactly. And in connection with what you have said and the main ideas you have pointed, we have a message from Bernabe saying that in Guatemala, mining companies have criminalized people, indigenous peoples who defend their land. And the companies bribe government workers and there have been lots of natural disasters. And so uh, regarding what Alejandra was saying about the Global North's position, uh, for example, in the US, they discuss climate change as a public security issue because of the accompanying migration. So how could we, can we deal with these effects taking into account that the countries that receive these uh, climate migrants are the ones that are responsible for the largest number, uh, volume of emissions. And so how can we start generating collaborative actions to provide or seek for solutions and responses to answers to all of these issues. I don't know who uh, Alice perhaps would like to uh, comment on this, not just not give an answer because there might not be just one answer. Alejandra, go ahead. Well, I can begin and then the others can add something. But as for the migration to the global north, something interesting we have seen in the last few years is this. 10, 20 years ago, and governments still think that this is an, still an emergency. They used to think that everyone was going to migrate to the global north because of the effects of climate change. And we are seeing that, we have seen that this isn't true. 
there are many strategies and the people who study international migration flows and climate crisis, we haven't seen or we don't think that we will have hordes of people coming to the global north as a consequence of the climate crisis. And it's important to consider this. We do have climate migrants, but it's not going to be the invasion uh, that some fear. I think Jeanne has more to say about this. Uh, well, uh, thanks, Alejandra. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I, I have uh, one point that I think is critical that came out here is that uh, you know this this th this global problem was is being caused by very few countries, and we know that. And uh, so, um, but the, to adapt, but the climate change. Uh, that derives from these actions is affected, affected, uh, uh, affecting everyone. So it affects everyone in different manners, in different perspectives. So one thing that is very important to me, and uh, in the migration, apologies, I'm not, I'm not a specialist on that, and I, I always learn a lot when I hear people like Alejandro, John, and Alice talking about. And uh, uh, it's... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, so that goes into the climate justice that's been discussed a lot. The, it's been discussed a lot of uh, uh, the 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 uh, inequalities associated that is that has been exacerbated uh, associated to, to climate change. Um, and uh, so, in that perspective, we I think at least in the in the climate world, I think we need clear actions and clear actions from the ones that were most. Uh, uh, strong uh, uh, players on this row on changing the global climate. So I think those, uh, uh, so if we, if we discuss in terms of, you know, resource uh, uh, support, if technology transfer, um, uh, you know, all these aspects, I think, are critical to, um, uh, to let's say, to reduce the inequality and reduce this, the um the 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 strength of the impacts in 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 regions of the globe that there are uh, less um, favored uh, or are uh, uh, that has less um, opportunities in several aspects. So I don't think uh, we 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 cannot have a word that do the same things that we did that that has been done by whoever has lead us to this. But what we need to do is to the transformation process that need to happen. It has to have uh, 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 um, a, a a flow of uh, uh, of, a, of a collaborative, I would say, in that perspective, thinking in a in a goodwill way of a collaborative way of trend of. of giving the opportunity for the countries that and the societies and that doesn't have means to you know to couple with the strength of the this of the change that is coming on that is going on we need to have that being effective so we, uh, when we look at and see the funds for you know loss and damage funds adaptation funds climate change funds they were not never really instrumentalized in the way that you know you can effectively change the 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 uh, uh or, or reduce vulnerability i'm not going to say about increased resilience because i agree with john in that perspective at all so but we need to reduce vulnerability uh, and and the vulnerability is associated to a broad perspective and in that way uh the the the, the you know the collaborative exchange of knowledge and transfer of support being that uh, uh you know technology or being the funds or being that you know effective actions i think it is absolutely critical so in terms of you know the juridical global system uh that has to be um, a strong um uh let's say a a, a strong um um uh, framing 
So uh, this can effectively happen. We know that we're going to a lot of denier, you know, with chance to be important players in the globe in the next year. And uh, that's a big issue. So we need to structure this, this uh, you know, the, the way of, uh, of, let's say, this collaborative <laughs> uh, actions to happen that are, are in, in a way, uh, they are... Um, um, uh, they are enclosed. They are not uh, susceptible to crazy guys that are, uh, you know, that can be running uh, uh, economies and countries world round. So uh, I think that's that's a big issue. So how we how the strength of this action can be, you know, can be materialized. So it, it's it's not vulnerable <laughs> to crazy people, and uh, and you know in this trend, I, I would say I might be naive here and apologize for that, but I would say that that also might help my help in terms of how communities deal with the, their vulnerability and uh, willing to stay where they are in a perspective not that not that migration is bad at all at all but you know if if you have the opportunity to stay at home some people prefer to stay at home so uh, that's that's my naive perspective but i think if the opportunity is given not not is given it's uh, it's not given because the opportunity is there you know um uh, but if the if the 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 means are also there so people can cop, couple with the, the change, talking only about climate change, I think that it's a it's a global beneficial uh, to to you know to society. Thank you so much, Jeanne. There are so many ideas. We've said so many things, many concepts and principles. Also, many comments and questions that we won't be able to address today. Um, because time is almost up. Uh, people talk about creating interdisciplinary strategies as well. Also, how people um, resist this work, but we also need interregional, interdisciplinary, and transdisciplinary work. Many comments talk about uh, how some policies and governments do not or refuse to be resilient or become resilient. And this ends up affecting the local communities and also place the blame on the local communities for global effects. There are many questions in this regard and we won't be able to address them, but they're all being considered so that we can uh, further develop, uh, develop them in the future. Finally, dear panelists and commentator, for 30 seconds, just a main idea. Um, in order to close this webinar. So first, Alejandra, John, Jeanne, and then Alice. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much for the invitation. And I think that my final thoughts um, are the following. The climate crisis is affecting everyone now. There's no safe place. Some places will suffer later impacts uh, and they will be different as well. Um, the, the shelter director told us some time ago that current public policies to help migrants will help ourselves in 10 years time when we have to move somewhere else and this might be affecting us. So this is like an existential existential crisis. Even if you're in the States or Europe, we're not protected from what's coming. And we need to work together to look after migrants to improve their living conditions and also to uh, implement uh, concrete and quick changes because this is coming. Thank you. Thank you. John.
Thank you. Jean. Uh, thank you very much. I also would like to thank uh, Alejandra, uh, Alice, um, Alice, <laughs> I don't know if uh, Alice or Alice, uh, John, and uh, for organizing this and having me here. So thanks a lot, Alexandra, Alexandra for uh, for uh, moderating. Uh, I think I think that uh, you know the point that Alejandra uh, talked about is that we need concrete actions, and I I do believe. Uh, besides a lot of things that I said, I'm an optimist. <laughs> besides being a realist. Uh, realistic, uh, but uh, I think that uh, we do have, uh, uh, you know, resiliencies among us for a long time, and I think we do have, uh, we we need we do have a future, but we need to think about it in a in, in, we think with the perspective. So we need to incorporate climate change in the planning for sure, because in the planning, in the understanding of uh, uh, movement, in the understanding of uh, the, you know, the production system, in the understanding of governance, we need to incorporate that. And it's not just at the surface, that's a big issue. Uh, we, we need to have this as part of our thinking on how to solve, uh, uh, how to solve, you know, global problems. So thank you very much again for the invitation. <laughs> thank you so much, Jean. Alice, you're the last one. Thank you so much. Congratulations also, Alexandra, um, for your presentations. And thank you everyone for your reflections throughout this session. My final message has to do with culture as well. We need to uh, remember the importance of the urgent matters, but, but we should also think about the cultural aspects because they should be considered as well. And maybe in some cases they might change but we should contemplate them. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much to our panelists, our commentator. Thank you to all the participants who have been here with us today in this uh, session, climate change, migration and health. We need to remember that climate change affects health always and we try we're trying to come up with uh, effective solutions to promote everyone's well-being in internal displacement movement and international migration in order to promote well-being please remember that our west next webinar is on tuesday the 3rd of september same time 11 a.m uh, um santiago de chile time and we will be talking about uh, populations on the move, how climate change affects my, migrations in transit in Latin America and the Caribbean. So you're all welcome to attend this webinar on the 3rd of September. Thank you so much. Thank you for your participation. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>